Hi, hi everyone. My name is Pragash. Um, I'm with um, Together AI, uh, working on some of the most exciting problems, um, and primarily focused on inference. Um, so today I'm going to give a talk about how we sort of integrated Dutch Compile, how we made it work, what are some of the challenges that you would have to consider in doing inference, and um, yeah, let's get started. <clears throat> Here's some of the quotes that some people have sort of circulated about the importance of inference, and I don't think I can do anything better to justify how important inference is in today's age, and it is almost unimaginable um, to see a future without a significant market share dealing with inference, and I think um, the number of problems that we have with test time compute and just sort of pushing the, the barrier of inference forward is just going to be there. And um, yeah. And obviously, I don't have to stress how important it is inference is for us, uh, evidently, uh, and how much we're passionate about inference. So, but obviously, inference is not without its challenges. And um, let me just walk through the high level. So, inference at a high level can be broken into two stages. You have the compute bound peripheral stage, where a bunch of tokens go in, pass through a model, like a special transform model that is populating a KB cache, and you're pretty much maximizing the arithmetic intensity here, and um, as opposed to sort of dealing with a lot of data movement and bandwidth bound, so essentially you're in a compute bound stage. <clears throat> but then you have that going from the initial stage to something that is. Um, a repeated series of like decodes, which is primarily uh, memory bound, dealing with a lot of skinny mat models, you're dealing with um, retrieving a long KV cache, and all of that adds up to finally where you're in the, in the re regime where <clears throat> you have a lot more data movement than you have computation. Right? Which sort of leads me to this roofline model. Um, and if you're going to push performance, Naturally, you're going to try to be moving up this line um, and pushing out the boundaries of arithmetic intensity here. Right? So what are some things to consider when you want to do that? So when you're doing decoding, um, and a lot of this has become sort of staple when you look at open source solutions like VLM, TGI, SGLang. A lot of them are sort of tackling these problems in a very, very many different ways. Um, some of the easy ones that people would think it's like, okay, you have kernel launch overhead, let's solve the ECUDA graphs. Um, you have a lot of chains of series of LMYS operations, which is going back and forth with reads and writes. You are very large in memory bound, you can solve it with fusion. So similarly, there's different, different problems with decode, and the list is essentially endless, uh, and this is sort of a subsample of what you can do with them. And all of them are known solutions that we can sort of tackle. Um, depth of solutions may differ. How we try to do the solutions may differ. Um, but fundamentally, a lot of this deals with like being better profiling, doing fusions, doing one shot all reduce, especially when you're intra node. Um, how do you get better prolog fusions? How do you get develop better kernels? And how do you just build a robust framework for inference that sort of you know keeps all this in mind and um, maximizes your performance in right from the get go, right? So it turns out that you get most of the gains just from doing um, the top half of the slides here. Um, and you can, as you can imagine, the 20% at the bottom is where the real complexity sort of relies. Um, and if you're going to sort of go from research to production, right, you're going to spend more of your time on the bottom 20%. And you don't want to spend a lot of cycles dealing with problems which are efficiently solved. Um, and that is where Torch Compel comes in. Um, so when you have new model custom architectures, rather than spending a long time figuring out what part of it you can solve, what part you can't solve, Torch Compel deals with all these things that can be solved right at the get-go. And then you essentially have, you leave us with the 20% margin where we try to push the boundaries even further. So how does Torch Compel essentially work? I think a lot of us um, kind of already familiar with this. Uh, it's going to run through it real quick. So it takes a PyTorch code, um, that's written probably in Python, and it goes through its 
the core of it, which is Tor, Dyn Tor Dynamo. Fundamentally tracing through your call stack, right down to the bytecode, extracting all of the ops, and compiling, I mean, sort of generating this graph of computation that you have. So this is just specifically in the inference context. In training, you would also have um, this AOT grad that generates the forward, uh, the backward pass as well. And the second half of this, um, this is where the interesting part comes in, which is that all the operations that we are familiar with, um, things like power and square and all these things, um, they get lowered to a low level subset of primitives um, that are later, you know, sort of stacked and grouped and identify these sub partitions where you can try to find opportunities of fusion, how you can sort of reuse buffers, um, sort of par partition your memory space into what are the outputs, dimensions, the sizes, um, the intermediates, and all that. And finally, um, when you're using the inductor backend, it starts generating the Trident code for it, right? And actually, after this part, which is touch inductor, the cool thing about this is that it tries to do this sort of knapsack thing where it tries to identify all these different subgraphs, lowering, I mean, sort of generating all the inductor code for this, and then profiling them and identifying the combination of subsets that really maximize performance end to end, and that becomes your ultimate code. Um, the downside of this is obviously it takes a very, very, very long time, uh, and I'm hoping that it gets fixed. Um, I think interestingly it's gonna get fixed uh, very soon, with AOT inductor. So there are four types of fusion that I sort of wanna just generally cover, um, and this is one of the key advantage for us uh, on how we move up that, um, the roof line chart, right? So you have vertical fusion, which is something that um, you have this chain of series ops, which like, this is, this is an example of RMS norm. Um, you're essentially sort of adding this LMS operations, and there's a lot of reads and writes in between that you can essentially fuse together, and that's vertical fusion. And then you have this epilogue fusion, which is typically following a gem, um, and that's the um, representative of um, a sweet glue, um, or some part of sweet glue. And then you have a horizontal fusion, which we don't really see in Llama, but you do see things like um, with Phi, or other sort of models that do parallel MLP, parallel uh, attention, um, and um, I think there's also, I don't remember other models, but there's a long list of them trying to do that. And back in the day, we had new X and stuff. Um, and then there's Prolog Fusion. And Prolog Fusion, is, um, this example here is actually doing activation uh, quantization along with uh, dequantization of the, the weight, uh, well, actually, uh, aggregate quantization, and then scaling down the <laughs> activation and then doing the gem in FP8, actually. Um, so that's the product for gem, which is entering into the gem. Um, and the interesting part of this is that Torch Compile really excels very well um, with the top half, actually. <laughs> um, and with the bottom half, it's a work in progress for them. But you know, that's sort of a hole that we try to fit in um, and do really well. So I want to sort of dive a little deeper on why vertical fusion is a fusion type uh, strategy such a matter. Um, so this is an example of how um, the underlying operation very abstracted out of um, doing sweet glue, right? So you would load the activation, you load the weight, and you have two reads right there. Um, know that W is essentially a lot uh, larger than X for decode, and then you would compute the gem and you store the value, then you load it back again in the next, in the next kernel launch to do the LNY CLU. And this can be completely absorbed into a single stacked call uh, where you're fusing in the gem and the epilogue um, to, do, to basically save one read and writes, right? And what that gets you is it's not just sort of pushing the envelope where we want it to go, right? Pushing the arithmetic intensity above the, the wall and sort of getting more performance out of it. 